My name is Magda Tetter. I'm delighted to welcome you today for our, um, our conversation uh, with Ephraim Shoham Steiner about his new uh, book. Um, I, before I introduce uh, Ephraim and his book, I want to um, say a few thank yous. I want to thank uh, my colleague Sarit uh, katank Ribitz for her uh, extraordinary leadership this year, and it's a very difficult act to follow, so I hope you will have patience with me. I also want to thank uh, Shaban Varleza, who has been uh, incredibly um, uh, helpful and active helping us putting these programs together. And um, I want to thank the New York Public Library because uh, Ephraim Sharm Steiner is our uh, NYPL Fellow in Jewish Studies, Fordham NYPL Fellow in Jewish Studies. Um, unfortunately, it's all virtual this year, but we hope he will be back with us uh, actually in flesh next year when uh, the pandemic is hopefully uh, uh, over. Um, the fellowship and the um, in public events we are all joining and participating in, in at Fordham University at our Center for Jewish Studies would not have been possible without the financial support of the Pickett Family Foundation, Mr. Eugene Schwedler, the Knapp Family Fa Foundation, and also you, uh, the audience. You've been incredibly generous and you are helping us to continue to put these stimulating public programs. So I thank you for your generosity and I thank you for joining us so faithfully over the uh, last year and, and before. So now let me introduce um, e e Effie, Effie Shoham Steiner. That's how we know him in, uh, in the field. Effie is uh, a well-known scholar. He's also a friend of many of us. Uh, he comes to us from Ben Gurion University, where he teaches medieval Jewish history, and where he is the director of the Center for the Study of Conversion and Interreligious Encounters. Uh, he's the author of his first book, uh, which came out first in Hebrew and then um, in English, which I just showed you, on the margins of a minority, leprosy, madness, and disability among Jews in medieval Europe. And today we're celebrating his new book, um, uh, The Jews and Crime in Medieval Europe, uh, for which we have a 30% discount code, and I will uh, chat it, uh, uh, put it in the chat form for, for you. But Effie is one of the most creative and innovative scholars of me medieval Jewish history. He is um, he uses rabbinic sources in an ex extremely creative and inventive way, uh, mining it for information that uh, earlier scholars assumed would not be there, but he always finds these incredible gems. And I love using his work in my classes, and I love using uh, this, his work uh, very much, uh, which is very much relevant in my own research. Just to give you a sense, in addition to the books that we, he has published, just to give you a sense of a couple of articles, titles, which we will be able to share with you later on, on what he does with rabbinic sources. So uh, uh, one article is uh, the Virgin Mary, Miriam and Jewish reactions to Marian devotion in high middle ages. Jews and healing in medieval saint shrines, participation, polemic, and shared cultures. And that my students love this article. Pharaoh's bloodbath, medieval Jewish thoughts about leprosy, disease, and blood therapy. After Effie finishes his, his, his presentation of his book, we will be joined by my colleague from the history department and medieval studies, Nicholas Paul who is an associate professor of history at Fordham, and he is the author of To Follow in Their Footsteps, Crusades and Family Memory in the High Middle Ages, co-editor of uh, a number of volumes, including Remembering the Crusades, Myth, Image, and Identity, uh, the, and, and also mo most recently, which I recommend to you, um, whose middle ages teachable moments for an ill-used past which examines how the medieval uh, period has been used and abused um, certainly by 
uh, white supremacist or not, and Effie is showing us the book. He's currently working on a project uh, that concerns the place of the Crusades within the aristocratic performance culture. We, and this project has been supported by Fulbright University, Fulbright University of Bar Birmingham in the UK. And uh, we are really delighted that he is going to join us for this uh, interdisciplinary conversation. So um, I will send you in the chat um, the uh, information how to get the discount for Effie's book. And I will also send you a link for other events that are coming up in the spring uh, for which you can uh, also RSVP. So without further ado, Effie, the screen is yours. Thank you, Magda. Thank you very much. This was a, a fabulous introduction and I'm, I'm really excited to be here today. Um, I'm going to be sharing my screen with you in just a moment. Uh, hopefully you're, you will see not my notes, but my, do you see the presentation without my notes? Is this okay? Oh, it's the presenter screen. Presenter screen, so I'll flip them. Hold on. Is this better? That's it. Okay. So first and foremost, and before we briefly delve into the book, uh, I want to thank the Jewish studies and the medieval studies programs at Fordham for collaborating in this crime of holding this book event in honor of Jews in crime in medieval Europe. It's only fitting that this book that I started working on as a senior research fellow at the Tikva Center for Jewish Law and Civilization at NYU School of Law 10 years ago will be celebrated in close physical proximity, whatever that means in Zoom dominated pandemic reality of today, uh, to the cradle of its birth in New York City. I wish to use this opportunity also to thank Professor Joseph Weiler and Professor Moshe Halbertal that headed the center at 22 Washington Square North for inviting me back then and enabling me to set up, to set out on this project. I was also lucky to have some very enabling and supporting colleagues during that first year. Gary Anderson from Notre Dame, Gabi Bloom from Harvard, Elisheva Karlbach from Columbia University, Bob Chazen from NYU, Perry Dane from Rutgers, Yair Loberboim from Bar Ilan University, Maoz Kahana from Tel Aviv University, and Michael Wolzer from Princeton University all shared my enthusiasm for the project and helped me in thinking about the issues discussed in the book. To be honest, Although the book began breathing in New York City, its genesis and inception was much earlier. It came to be as I was planning my doctoral project back in the late 90s. I was young and bald, and I was young and bald enough to suggest a far too ambitious undertaking that would explore social attitudes towards a host of individuals who were deemed marginal in medieval European Jewish society. I was fascinated by the application of social science methodologies to the research of historical sciences and societies. Even more, I was intrigued by the growing number of studies that rather than focusing on the mainstream of medieval society, looked at the margins. In my research proposal, I suggested a study of the lives and plight of individuals with physical and mental disabilities, a group I labeled involuntary marginals. And the project was also originally intended to include the lives and the social attitudes towards the criminal margins of Jewish society, whom I termed voluntary marginals. The wise counsel of some of my mentors deterred me from such an overambitious undertaking. In the end, my doctoral dissertation considered the lives of Jewish men and women who suffered from leprosy, madness, and physical disability. The book based on my dissertation was published in Hebrew in 2008, as Magda mentioned, and in 2014, an updated and slightly abridged version appeared in English. The current book, on Jewish involvement in crime and the social attitudes towards crime and criminals in medieval Jewish society takes up the material left out, so to speak, of my doctoral dissertation, people who chose to behave contrary to social norms of their time. Although I'm a historian, I want to make it clear that this book is not a history, so to speak, in the simple sense of the word, of Jews and crime in medieval Europe. The available sources, both those produced by contemporary Jewish communities and legal and administrative sources that hail from the predominantly Christian society in which Jews were embedded are not adequate for such an endeavor. We simply do not have the figures and the facts. 
There is no registry of Jewish involvement in criminal actions, nor are there court records or even lists of sentences handed down by tribunals of the kind that we have that have come down to us from other medieval societies. The records that we have are sporadic and the picture becomes clearer only with the rise of the communal and urban bureaucracy in the later Middle Ages. Rather, in this book, I engage in what we can call literary archeology, span an attempt to uncover the way crimes of the violent economic and social na nature are depicted in medieval literary works, primarily rabbinic sources, as Magda mentioned, but also other medieval narratives. Examining the way crimes are depicted in these documents, I gleaned information about what crimes were committed, to what extent the perpetrators were aware that they were breaching norms, and how the transgressors were treated by their respective communities. For example, a response by Rabbi Meir of Rothenburg about an aguna from mid 13th century German city of Koblenz tells us the story of a presumed assassination of a certain Jew by hitmen hired by a fellow Jew. The aguna is a woman bound in marriage by a husband who either refused to grant her a divorce or as in this case, went missing and the evidence about his fate is the case at hand. The man's body was never found. The culprits were never caught, interrogated or brought to justice. All the Jewish court had was a deliberation between two sets of rumors, one of which spoke of a gruesome murder and a body that was found buried in a very peculiar way. So unless one is willing to go off the beaten track and veer to discussions about marriage and divorce, business dealings that went south, the handling of synagogues and who is fit to lead the community in prayer, questions pertaining to inheritance and to the distribution of alms and charity, as well as other fields of Jewish law, the evidence about crime just doesn't lend itself easily. The subject of Jewish crime in, in the Middle Ages cannot be divorced from the libels and <clears throat> leveled by Christians at Jews during that era. It is therefore very fitting that one of today's speakers is Magda, who dedicated an entire monograph to this topic. And what you have in front of you in the slide is an invitation to a book launch that my center in Ben Gurion University is uh, throwing in honor of Magda's book. Christians charged that Jews killed the savior, that they engaged in the ritual murder of Christians and that Jews sought in their greed and to defraud and impoverish their Christian neighbors. There were thus at times presumptively seen collectively as criminals and murderers. A study such as mine runs the risk of perpetuating such accusations and even being used by modern anti-Semites to further their agenda. Fear that this would happen has led to self-censorship. On this last matter, I wish to share with you a short anecdote that may illustrate this point and demonstrate just how deep this premise runs. Back in 2010, when I first began working on this book as a fellow at the NYU School of Law, I was asked a few times to share bits of my research with Jewish communities in the greater New York area. It happened more than once that as I finished sharing my finds with community members, I was approached by members of the audience, usually older members of the audience, um, whose accent revealed they had immigrated to the United States from Europe, and it was as if they all had coordinated their response. Most of them thanked me for the lecture, but then added, but why are you exposing the Shanda? To those of you not familiar with this Yiddish term, it comes from a similar high middle German word that means shame or disgrace. Interestingly, not only members of the community with a vivid memory of anti-Semitic accusations and persecutions, but also Jewish scholars have deliberately disagreed or disregarded some of the source material I mine in this book out of fear of its implications for the image of the Jews and as part of a long tradition of apologetics. Other scholars did not ignore the material but have downplayed its significance while others who have also acknowledged the existence of Jewish crimes and criminals tended at times to portray such social phenomena as a result of the bad influence, so to speak, of the majority society on Jews attempting to steer clear from an in-depth analysis to such social phenomena. I admit that I was advised by some colleagues not to pursue this subject altogether. And I also suspect that the fact that my attempt to receive research grants 
by foundations or from foundations that focus on Jewish heritage were also turned down due to the unappealing nature of this topic. As I mentioned, it is no secret that non-Jews during the Middle Ages and into the early modern and modern periods often portrayed Jews as criminals. While these accusations were for the most part unfounded and were indeed part of the overall attempt to discredit Jews, in other cases, the accusations were not altogether baseless. In the introduction to the book, I refer to the famous coin clipping accusations against English Jewry in the late 1270s. These accusations put the entire Jewish community of England in grave danger. Hundreds of Jews were arrested. Many of them were interrogated. Most of the confessions affirming to the coin clipping and monetary, monetary debasing claims were attained by means of torture and physical and mental intimidation, casting a dark shadow of doubt about their credibility. Nevertheless, during the same years, we hear Jewish dignitaries like the aforementioned Rabbi Mayor of Rothenburg and his less famous colleague, Rabbi Judah Sarhabira, boldly reprimanding in an inner Jewish source written in Hebrew, Jews who were involved in coin clipping in Northern France, making it clear that such accusations were not all baseless. On the other hand, European municipal, civic, and criminal records from the later Middle Ages, especially those of a more local nature, offer further indications of significant involvement of Jews in crime. Arguably, the sources from outside the Jewish community are often motivated by anti-Jewish bias and prejudice. Previous research has shown that in the 15th century, when such sources are in relative abundance, Jews were more often indicted and falsely accused of crimes than their Christian neighbors. When convicted, they were sentenced more severely than Gentiles and committed <clears throat> who committed the same offenses. And when punished, the punishment was executed in a manner more humiliating and degrading. At times, gruesome forms of executions were reserved especially for Jews. By now, you have all gathered that the picture of the medieval Jewish past on these matters is not monochrome or simple. It's not binary, and it can be simply described as complex. So why did I choose to write this book? I see crime and the involvement in criminal activities as another prism through which to view society. Crime and the breach of norms supply us with, an, with the in, <clears throat> instances where social values and accepted truths are put to the ultimate test. The book we are discussing today is the product of a comprehensive research project that collected and analyzed evidence from an array of sources on medieval Jewish involvement in crime and in the medieval Jewish criminal underworld. To obtain information about the Jewish men and women who were involved in what is generally considered crime, I searched out sources that define a person of criminal, either by stating so explicitly or by labeling him or her with another term used to designate criminal activity. These sources were, for the most part, not written by the alleged criminals themselves, but rather by external observers. I wanted to see how Jews related to these individuals that engaged in crime, how, who, uh, <clears throat> how were they treated by Jewish society? How did the Jewish communities grapple with the questions of breaching norms? Irreverence to the law, especially when they were granted internal autonomy, albeit curbed when the, tool, when the tools for enforcement were somewhat elusive and heavily dependent on voluntary consent. How could group cohesion be maintained, especially as a minority group when faced by people who display disregard to the group's norms? And finally, when do Jewish authorities realize that they are helpless and need to call in the non-Jewish cavalry to help them against their own, an act that some Jews would label with the pejorative term messira, literally meaning handing over, ratting out, enabling others to take control. The book explores both cases that are clear cut and others that display just how strained these realities were. Another reason I was intrigued by these questions has to do with the nature of the sources I discuss in the book. Some of the sources enable a unique glance into the lives of people from the less recorded social strata of medieval society, an attempt to use the sources written by members of the learned elite to illuminate the lives of people from beyond the circles of the elite, beyond the pale of decent society from the margins. 
sometimes these sources surprised me. I learned early on how relative the term marginal can be and just how the center and the margins can be sometimes even overlapping. Let us briefly look at one example. What you see in front of you is a manuscript called the Prague Manuscript from the Jewish Museum, number 20. Uh, it's a 14th century Ashkenazi manuscript that contains a large collection of responses attributed mostly to Rabbi Meir of Rothenburg, which we mentioned earlier. The Prague printed edition of this responsa appeared in 1608. It was already, however, in the 19th century that scholars from the Wissenschaft des Judentums movement noted that some of the material in the collection dates back to a much earlier era and reflects an earlier source from the 11th century. These texts contain a, certain, a section scholars identified as penned by Rabbi Judah ben Meir the Elder of Mainz, who died in 1060. Rabbi Judah was a Jewish judge in Mainz, but he was an acclaimed adjudicator and legal consultant to communities from as far east as Hungary and Poland. One of the, of the trials in which he presided as judge described a financial dispute between two local Jews from Mainz. It is not a criminal procedure, but rather a civic case, a business quarrel brought before a Jewish scholar of law serving as an arbitrator. One of the two Jews had bought stolen gold from a renegade Christian cleric who came to town from his monastery. The other Jew, having found out that the cleric was a renegade and that he had stolen gold and sold it, arranged for an extortion of this renegade cleric. The extortion was to be performed by, a raiding, <clears throat> by raiding a local brothel where the renegade cleric had gone to spend his recently obtained cash. The person that was assigned to the task of the violent extortion was a certain local Christian patrician of some rank in town who had pre-existing business ties with the Jew who orchestrated the plan. This patrician owed the Jew some money the plan was to extort the renegade cleric, collect the money, clear the old debt, the patrician owed the Jew, and leave the patrician with extra money from the extortion as a compensation for his effort. The patrician performed the extortion plan, but as it sometimes is the case in these matters, authorities caught wind of the plan, got involved, and the business connection between the cleric and the first Jew was revealed causing the first Jew to lose twice. First, the money he paid for the gold and the gold object that the renegade cleric sold him that was confiscated by the authorities. The matter came to the court because the losing Jew sued the planner of the extortion for causing him financial harm. This case is a treasure trove packed with historical goodies in just a few sentences. First of all, it speaks volumes about criminal cooperation between Jews and non-Jews viewed on both ends of the case. The cooperation seems to be no more than an extension of regular business. <clears throat> Moreover, neither side seems to be a marginal individual in the community. Both seem to be people with some standing and connection. The renegade cleric most probably sold the gold to a person who was an acquaintance of the monastery someone who performed such legally sanctioned deals in the past, not some fence off the street. The same is true of the Jew who planned the extortion. Second, in the case, in this case, as others in the book, uh, um, the bring forth something rather unique for the 11th century. The voices of non-noble, non-ecclesiastical, non-royal players in the medieval German urban arena. The account by Rabbi Judah brings forth quotes from the statements made by the interlocutors in the courtroom. The language of the statements is in the text is Hebrew, and it probably was not the language used in the courtroom. But this is as probably as close as we may get to hearing the voices of 11th century burghers. When I read this material and uh, when I present it to fellow medievalists, I was told that there were very few noted instances when one may listen to the actual voice of an 11th century city dweller from the German empire. Due to the very professional and insular nature of this text, it is very explicit in the use of words describing the crimes. The cleric in the text appears both as ganav, literally meaning thief, and also as galach, 
meaning a conjured individual. The shady nature of the business transaction is clear from the very beginning, and it is acknowledged and not blurred by Rabbi Judah, <clears throat> whose own notes or the notes of his court uh, clerk were the ones that preserved the case for us. There is no moral judgment in the minutes of the case that came before us in this collection of responsa. True, that if there was such a moral reckoning, it may have been omitted by later copyists. But given the extent of the material preserved, this case, this does not seem to be the case here. In similar cases by the older Rabbi Gershon ben Yehuda of Mainz, one of Rabbi Judah's teachers, we find coded Hebrew terms and biblical allusions that reveal, albeit covertly, the legal desires, the legal decisor's discontent with the moral aspects of the 11th century business life. Rabbi Judah ben Menachem Akohen, the elder, at least in this case, does not pass moral judgment, but rather offers a ruling in the dispute between the two Jews. Before I conclude, I would like to make one last point. Although this book is a scholarly book about the medieval world in Europe, I believe we can learn a lot from the cases it brings forth. It is for this reason that I chose to add to the book a lengthy appendix with the translations of some of the texts discussed at length in the book. In my mind, the book offers some points that reflect on matters that concern us today as well. I will demonstrate this point by referring to the section of the book that discusses the interface between women and criminal deeds. One of the chapters in the third section of the book discusses prostitution. In it, I was especially drawn to a source from the very few writings that have survived from the late 15th century rabbinic figure, Rabbi Judah Mintz of Padua. The text appears as part of this halachas small collection of responsa preserved among the larger collection of his younger student and relative, Rabbi Meir Katzenelbogen of Padua. When carefully reading the late 15th century text, we learn that it is not an answer to a legal quarry, Rabbi Judah was asked, but rather a statement he penned as a Jewish policymaker in the growing German Jewish immigrant community in the northern Italian city of Padua. Rabbi Judah stated that he decided to deviate from an ascribed age-old Talmudic prohibition and had sanctioned the marriage of a nursing mother who wished to remarry in violation of the said prohibition. The reason he gave in the statement for his drastic break from tradition was that he would have refrained, from, if he would have refrained from doing so, he would have facilitated prostitution. It seemed in his vicinity, among the growing German Jewish immigrant community in Padua, and possibly in the greater Ashkenazi diaspora forming in Northern Italy, a growing number of young women, especially single mothers, were targeted by Jewish procurers who attempted to bully them and use their defenseless young women and turn them into prostitutes. The Jewish community in Padua seems to have been, seems from the statement to have been a battleground between people with means and standing in the community who Rabbi Judah called paritzim, literally meaning sexually promiscuous. And himself, some of his students and some affluent women in the community who allied with him to prevent the moral breach. The particulars of the case that triggered the ruling are too elaborate to list here. You can read them in the book. What is striking is the pattern. Similar patterns appear in later periods and even in our own time regarding women trafficking and attempts to prostitute young immigrant women when they are in dire financial, social, emotional, and physical need. I was impressed by the boldness of the statement, the acknowledgement of the problem, and the halachic decisor's ability to stand against inner Jewish formidable powers and his ability to create unexpected alliances and make a bold statement against an ingrained legal tradition in an attempt to prevent what he envisions as a moral avalanche. As you can imagine, I can talk about this book all afternoon, but I'm curious and eager as you are to hear what Magda and Nick also have to say about the book. I will end as I started with extending my thanks to the colleagues and friends with whom I discussed many aspects of this project and whose insights and wise counsel is embedded in the final product. I wish also to thank 
the very able staff at Wayne State University Press, the editor, Annie Martin, the former editor, Kathy Wilfong, and also the person who was the matchmaker between me, my scholarly work, and Wayne State University Press, Professor Frank Counterfogel of Yeshiva University, who suggested this publishing house to me and helped me during the years that this book was in the making. Thank you all. Okay, thank you so much, Effie. That was really wonderful. Um, so I want to encourage all of you to ask questions in the Q&A section of your screen. Um, we, for the next few minutes, uh, Nick and I will have a conversation, ask some of our own questions. So Nick, why don't you, why don't you start? Sure, thanks so much, uh, Magda, and thanks for inviting me to do this. I'm uh, really pleased to be able to participate in this event. Um, as Magda told all of you, I'm the Director of Medieval Studies at Fordham. Um, and as Effie actually points out in the introduction to his book, uh, medieval studies or the medievalist, right, is historically very much associated with the study of Latin Christian majority population in Europe. Uh, and I uh, definitely fall into that camp. Uh, let's just say that's been the case up till now. But I think it's very important uh, that we break down these barriers between the medievalist uh, and the specialist in Jewish studies and Jewish history as we're doing now. Um, and and, and I, I hope that this uh, leads to further kind of conversations like this. I'll add one small plug for our annual conference in medieval studies coming up on March 20th and March 21st, which for instance is about medieval French, but features a panel uh, discussion on uh, French in the world of medieval Hebrew. So these conversations can, can happen. Um, uh, so while we raise our coffees to toast for the collaboration and breaking down the barriers, uh, I want to just say that um, uh, how, how extraordinary this experience was to read this book. Um, uh, this is a book that deals with crime uh, very much in a social context as, mu as much as it is an intellectual, legal, and theolo theological context. And as a result, it touches on a, a, a great range of major themes in historical sco scholarship. So notions about types of property, about agency, both real and imagined, um, authority that exists within and between communities. It deals with huge topics like violence, rape, sin, emotions, sex work, uh, the intersection between the subjected statuses of uh, women uh, and uh, Jewish communities uh, and, and many others. Uh, it also takes in a, a great variety of source materials, all of which was new to me, by the way. And I, I apologize for my ignorance regarding these things and also probably my inability to pronounce things correctly. But <laughs> it takes in a range of source materials in a variety of different genres, uh, some of which are highly literary, uh, but are composed over a vast chronological range and are also written down over a geography that stretches from Iberia to Baghdad. And more than that, all of these materials or many of these materials are actively in conversation with one another. So imagine trying to unpack all of that to tell the kind of story that Effie does here in this book. And not, but not only is it extraordinarily ambitious in this way, it is actually very successful. It's very readable. Uh, and I would venture that it was written explicitly so that it might be accessible to non-specialists in Jewish history and culture like myself, but also to non-medievalists. Uh, it's that rare thing. It's a scholarly book that would be fully accessible to non-scholars. And that goes to both the uh, range of appendices that are included of these primary sources, which are make it essentially, you know, essential for teaching, but also uh, just the, the text of the book itself really is uh, widely available. And I would I would finally add in my in my commentary about the book that not only was I, I sort of converted to uh, the, the study of all of these questions and, and, and texts, but I also was convinced that uh, we need, I need to option a Netflix series about uh, Rabbi Judah the Pious, the crime fighting mystic of 13th century Regensburg, who solves crime and convinces everyone he's doing it by magic. Uh, that's that's got to happen. <laughs> so my first question for you, I, I have many questions that come out of this that have to do with uh, uh, these 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 larger questions that you raise, also very specific ones that are ju I just uh, um, uh, I kind of have to know the answer to. But I'll start off with actually something quite broad and maybe maybe difficult in, in a big question, but it's something that struck me right the way through. So you you say in your introduction, and you've just told us here, 
about the very interesting forces, the sort of nexus of forces, which you actively identify as schools of thought that have determined an approach or a lack of approach to the question of Jews and crime in the Middle Ages. And you show how these forces go back so quite some way, This, uh, whether it's the fear of the Shanda, which you talked about uh, quite some way into the 20th century and beyond. But as I was reading the book, I was also thinking about how resonant many of the cases you deal with and the questions that you raise are to our present moment. So this past year has been one of major reflection uh, here in the US on the nature of justice and crime, and particularly how majority communities police and prosecute members of minority communities. Uh, and I wonder about how and whether you're uh, the sort of, you know, the world we are living in now and the, the big questions that are being asked now about crime and policing um, may have informed your thinking as you were writing the book, or maybe given the timing of the book's publication, your feelings about it now that it's out. I must say it's it's interesting because I, uh, you know, um, when one plans this, this undertaking, um, I, I started off, as I said, in 2010, I was convinced this book would be out, you know, in, 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 a, in a jiffy. Um, but I was a bit too over presumptuous. But uh, indeed, this does bring a lot of thought about the over policing and the scrutiny of minorities. I mean, it, it is very present, I think, in the book in many ways uh, that the people that come forward, that the people that write the text, um, especially the scholars, especially the rabbinic authorities, the people who are, so to speak, um, trying to protect the Jewish community, they're to them, there is an omnipresence of being looked upon, of being under the gaze of someone else. Um, they need to be holier than thou. They feel that they have to project this sense. And that's on the one hand. On the other hand, there are the regular social forces that function within any community, regardless of who they are and as, as pious as they would wanna think of themselves. And they need to kind of mediate between these two extremes. Um, and I think in many ways, they realize also that their own over-policing over their own people um, is also something that is limited because as I said in my introduction, and I, I also mentioned today, one of the things that is dominant in this field is that the Jewish communities, although they have their autonomy and they have internal uh, uh, governance over their own, um, it's a lot to do with some sort of voluntary understanding that we all abide by this, right? And when you over-police and when you push the limits and when you try and, and reprimand people uh, to, to submitting to some higher values and higher morals um, and trying to be holier than thou, that sometimes can backfire. And every a uh, decision maker, every adjudicator um, is faced exactly with this strain and the understanding that one needs to kind of regulate uh, one's uh, uh, re re reaction to any of the social phenomena that appear, even if there is a breach in norm, even if there is crime. Uh, so for instance, one of the things that I, I found fascinating is how these people deal with instances of either manslaughter or even murder within the community, right? Um, it doesn't happen all so often, right? But when it does, what do you do? What do you do if you have a murderer in your midst? Do you ostracize him? Do you just send him off? Do you shun him and, and you know, that's it? Mm. Or do you create a certain module of regulating the penance and the punishment so that one would see some sort of horizon of reincorporation, reintegration into the community, right? On the one hand, you want to show such an individual that you are very strongly opposed to what has happened, regardless of whether it's deliberate, especially if it's deliberate murder, but even if it's not deliberate, the, the, the taking of a human life is, 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 a, is a crisis, it's a huge crisis, especially for a tightly knit community. So you need to regulate the penance and the punishment in a fashion that would kind of, you know, balance between 
the social forces from within, the person who is on the receiving end, um, and still create some sort of cohesion within the group so that it won't be fractured, right? So I, I, I just think, I mean, just to, to, just to uh, jump in there. Um, so you, this idea of balance that you talk about is one of the things that really struck me. And although you, you know, you, you introduce this caveat, you say that, you know, this, the, the conditions we're talking about here are very specific, right? And, and they're constructed by the idea here of the minority community um, uh, uh, you know, uh, needing to police or wanting to wanting to create a, a order in policing itself, and also uh, um, by um, the uh, uh, the 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 interaction with this with the potential for a very different legal system with all kinds of different set of punishments. But I I was really struck by you know some of the some of the the mechanisms you talked about specific ones. Um, uh, uh, the especially the the Guyanic protocols uh, mm -hmm. and and how they are received and interpreted. So you talk about essentially um, ritual, the importance of ritual punishment, like mm -hmm. uh, you know the, the, why, why ritual punishment can be powerful, why it can be useful. Um, the idea I thought uh, you know of um, how to create. Uh, someone as an exile without exiling them from the community. So the the shunning of a person, it really struck me as is describing something like prison, right? Something like the experience of imprisonment, but without prisons. Uh, right. You know, imprisoned in in the community. Um, the the idea uh, that you describe you describe it very concisely as the fear of losing in the case of murder, the fear of losing both the victim and the murderer. That the community has and to the family. Sorry. And the family, right, and the, the family. larger family. They're 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 all all three are intertwined, right? That sense that it produced by the the fear the, in this case the very specific fear that someone might um, if they are exiled that they would be lost to the community altogether. They would convert or or who knows? I I also wonder whether they would be sub subjected to some other form of danger or violence mm -hmm. uh, because they were they were excluded. Um, that that is something that is a, such tremendous concern that uh, that that actually moderates or, or creates its own uh, structure for uh, punishment to thinking about, thinking about punishment. I thought that the idea of the time of rage uh, mm -hmm. and the allowance for the time of rage, especially in this case, following uh, imprisonment from what is seen to be an illegitimate authority. Mm -hmm. These are all strike me as so potentially important and interesting right now uh, in, in contemporary society. Um, but I, although obviously, as you say, right, being very careful to understand that this is, this is generated by a, a very specific set of circumstances, it nonetheless seems to me to be all extremely useful things to think with. So let me jump in because I think the comments are, are quite uh, interesting in the way I, I had some questions for you, Effie. And one of the things that struck me is because you, um, you stretch over such a long period of time that you mentioned it in the introduction, but there are no legal codes in Europe or for that matter, even, I mean, there is the Mishnah, there are certain rabbinic texts that guide the Jewish community, um, but they are created in Palestine and, you know, second century Palestine, or maybe in, you know, but still not in the context of, of the environment in, in which the uh, Jews live. So how do you negotiate over this stretch of time when there is really, there are some kind of communal norms um, on the one hand, and then over time, we see the Christian European authorities developing some sort of criminal laws and codes by the 13th century, certainly, uh, we, we already see it in Northern Europe. Um, so how do you negotiate that use of, um, of Jewish sources to understand the, not just the values of the, of the community, but the social and legal dynamics of the life of Jews in, in the in medieval period. And what was really interesting for me is that although you use, and you don't say it explicitly because it's such a, it seems like it's such an internal book uh, by, by focusing on the rabbinic sources and what they say about crime and crimes and misdemeanors, it at some point reflects back 
on that pos legal position of Jews in Christian Europe, which is autonomous, right? And it's autonomous because there are no kind of legal codes. There is nothing like we have today. Um, so I wonder whether you can reflect on that history, on that kind of sh really shared history of Jews in Christian Europe while looking through this material that seems to be inward looking at, at some level on that sort of legal context as well as the cultural context. Well, first of all, thanks very much. This is, you know, you're pitching me a curveball because um, what, what is really amazing is that what we see from a legal point of view is that how these codices emerged more or less simultaneously. In other words, it would the Jewish community would see books like Or Zarua and Rokeach. These are two legal codices that try to codify Jewish behavior, um, more or less at the same time that we start finding the European legal codes. And this is a kind of uh, um, uh, a very tandem dance between the two systems. And, and they are definitely looking at one another and definitely drawing from one another. And one of the things that I also think comes out in the book is that concepts about crime and about penance and about retribution um, trickle from outside uh, the Jewish community. And, and people adopt these norms. Um, for instance, um, there's a fascinating source from the 13th century where people um, follow um, kind of uh, notions of vergelt from the Germanic law that if one has maimed someone, one should also compensate with a certain, you know, a drop down menu of how to compensate people who've been maimed or even killed in, a, in, in an altercation. And, and some of the rabbis tend to kind of incorporate this idea while others uh, tend to try and, and, you know, keep it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. When you, when you know what's happening in Europe, you can see there is this dance, there's this dialogue, right? Mm -hmm. Don't sell stolen goods. Well, guess what? It's in the privileges mm -hmm. to the Jews. And you can see it without that being mentioned explicitly. Oh, the Christian authorities do X, Y, and Z and prohibit X, Y, and Z. There is this, you know, um, embracement and integration of those mm -hmm. norms and those legal later on the absolutely, laws absolutely. into the, 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 the rabbinic discourse as well. Uh, absolutely. And again, yeah. so and let's, uh, let's um, take a look at some uh, questions. I mean, we can continue, I'm sure, yeah. the, the, but there are a few questions that our, our uh, audience have, uh, have asked. One is very uh, specific. Can you explain the coin clipping? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's basically it's basically very simple. If if a coin is made of of a, of, a, of a precious metal and it weighs a certain amount um, and it is also minted by the government by by the, the by monarchy um, with the face of the monarch on it, uh, what you do is you want to devalue the coin and of course create your own small trove of precious material. Uh, we have we know that um, there are accusations of people engaged in the practice called sweating. You take the coin, and especially since we're not talking about very um, uh, elaborate alloys, but very simple uh, metal, uh, people use them in their hands. And with a sweat of their hands, they create a, a um, kind of, uh, uh, with, with, with the uh, salt from the sweat, uh, it kind of uh, creates a, a liquid that drops. And, and then you, you uh, save it and, and, you, and you keep it and you, you debase the coin by that in that manner. Or you clip the coin with, with scissors or with a knife and you debase the coin. And that of course was, was a felony that was not only considered economical, it was of course considered as um, undermining uh, the system of credit in the entire uh, uh, kingdom. And, and Jews are, are accused of doing that. And it's also a materiality of it, right? That you can right. cut the coins, right. which is right. again, very, right. very interesting. Um, Nick, of course, chime in if you have any, uh, you know, comments. I, that can I just, I, I, so, so my, your last question was about, um, you, you were getting to some of the sources and I, I, I mean, the sources is really a really, one of the parts of this that I found the most fascinating because partly because this is all completely new to me, but, but I was really struck by, um, 
looking at the the responsa that you were the, that you're using now. Um, the, the, I, I'm fascinated to know, you know, the the, the process by which those uh, that we find them in the manuscripts. So often there, you you make you're very careful to point out that we're looking at a you know it's been it's been written down usually much long after the the time of the the authority who had actually come up with the responsum and it's um, uh, it, collected presumably for some reason that has to do with learning the mm -hmm. law that it, that it can be applied. I was also curious though about how these cases, which sometimes it seemed to me that the uh, authorities who, who wrote the response are, they seem very heroic, right? They're, they're solving problems. Mm -hmm. um, the community is coming to them for help. They solve problems, they exhibit their wisdom and they're also their magnanimity and you know mm -hmm. they're, helping, they're helping everyone and trying to be just. Whether, did those collections of responsa, were they like uh, uh, also about you know giving a, the community a strong sense of I identity as well as you know providing something useful that they can be used in future jurisprudence? Um, well, first of all, thank you. That's a, that's a swell question. It's, it's really uh, amazing. Um, uh, first of all, I think that definitely so. Um, um, I'll give you a small example. Some of the some of the people. One of the people we I mentioned also in the in, in today's uh, uh, presentation, Mayor of Rothenburg. He's a very he has a very strong sense of self awareness. Um, he keeps a record of many of his responses. Uh, stuff that he receives and he writes back. He has a secretary, his brother, his own brother, his sibling, Abraham is his uh, secretary and he writes down and we have more than a thousand responsa of this man. Um, and he traveled around quite a bit and he keeps record and he keeps a record that travels around with him. And eventually after he dies uh, in captivity in 1293, his students decide to reproduce and, and, and copy and kind of disseminate this knowledge of his. So this is a source of not only personal identity, but also of communal identity. Um, and you are absolutely right in, in, in de depicting the people who respond to halakhic quarries as people who are trying also to, to create a community, right? They want people to write to them and they want to distribute their knowledge and they want to by that distribute their authority and so on. Um, but it does also create a kind of map of identity, um, mm -hmm. right? Um, Jews living in Germany would turn to their local respondent and would not necessarily turn to someone in Spain unless they don't have someone to turn to, right? So it creates a regional identity. Mm -hmm. um, the reason this uh, material kind of gets around is because it is legal uh, uh, precedent. And, and a lot of the scholars try and accumulate um, these codices where, or anytime they come to a new place or they learn with someone new, they try and copy from the existing copies, similar to what you would find in monasteries when monks travel around or scholars travel around and they arrive at a library they go on a spree of kind of trying to preserve the knowledge that uh, is in that uh, area so that they would be also in, in close proximity to the knowledge and they will have it in their own library, so to speak. Now, and what we have, you were asking about the materiality of it, um, typical Ashkenazi collections of the 14th century, that's when a lot of these manuscripts come down in writing, um, sometimes are hundreds of folios long and they have a tremendous array of sources in them. Some response, uh, legal uh, uh, discussions, uh, halachic uh, uh, or, or, or um, uh, codices, um, <coughs> sometimes stories. Uh, at the end of these codices, you would find materia medica of sorts because people are using that as well and it's transmitted knowledge. So they put it down in writing and it, it these, all these codices travel around. We have quite a few of those in, in libraries scattered all around the world. And that kind of corresponds uh, with the codification in Europe, in Christian Europe at that time, this sort of record keeping and the need. So it might, you mm -hmm. know, be yet another example of that kind of influence and dialogue and, and awareness, which leads me to one of the questions that our uh, one of the members of the audience asked. Um, 
about whether the, the rabbis, the rabbinic leadership, uh, Jewish community leadership, explicitly tell the, the, the Christian um, authorities what the community's views uh, were, right? That is, did the, this manifest in relationship with rulers, especially when uh, Jewish jurisprudence was the opposite of local norms? So how did they negotiate um, the views of uh, of authority is, uh, I mean, they, they obviously the Christian authorities viewed Jewish communities as legitimate, uh, mm -hmm. but I think you, they, someone wants, would like to you to elaborate on that, uh, on that legitimacy of Jewish authority and those norms that are then transmitted. Right. So um, the, the more we move into the later Middle Ages, these norms would eventually be asked to be written down in writing. So we, we would have in a later period, especially in the early modern period, are these uh, books of communal regulations that are supposed to be also transparent to the authorities, right? Um, our, our friends, Deborah Kaplan and Jaspa Plitsky are, and Elisheva Karlobach are involved in this um, uh, uh, project of trying to put together a list of all these books of regulations that Jewish communities write down because they are asked by the community, by authorities outside the community to come up with a good list of what the regulations are. Um, in the earlier Middle Ages, it's, it's usually regulated through the privileges. In other words, the authorities realize that the Jews have their norms and codes, and as long as they are practiced, and as long as there's someone enforcing them, and as long as stuff doesn't spill over, or violence doesn't spill over, or um, uh, crime doesn't spill over, as long as the Jews know how to regulate their own, um, the authorities are happy with it. Um, and, and with no, not too much prying into their business. Actually, there are cases we have where uh, um, legal, Jewish legal authorities um, test and, and attest and talk to the, uh, um, the authorities and say, you are, you are trespassing the boundaries. There are boundaries that are put in the regulations. The regulations are the privileges. You're not supposed to uh, meddle with our own internal issues, stay away, right? Um, you would find that, on the other hand, when Jews transgress and they are um, arrested uh, and they find themselves on trial, the Jewish community might move in and say, we are willing to ransom this person so that we will internally charge him, we will internally also punish him, uh, so that our internal integral uh, um, autonomy will be retained without an external uh, body kind of prying into our particulars. And do you see any, that's one of the questions tying into it, uh, the, the different forms of punishment, obviously the Jewish community, Jewish authorities wanted to, leaders wanted to keep it internally, uh, but do you see at any point uh, as, as, as of, no, oh, we don't want to deal with it. Let's take that criminal and hand it over to non-Jewish authorities, which rabbinic sources traditionally prohibit. But were there any indications or any cases in which that was the proper way, way to do it? And that's what your your rabbis may have been saying. Uh, like, can you can you address that? Um, sure. I, I I think cases such as this did exist. In other words people are also aware of their limitations and, and the limitations of how much they can uh, um, produce as far as, as control of society goes. Uh, when, when someone is a rogue criminal, um, at, at the end of the day, someone needs to call in the cavalry and say, this is as far as it goes. Um, what is interesting, of course, is the discourse about Mesira, about handing over. If I were to hand over someone, my neighbor for some reason to the authorities, I would be considered uh, a moser, and I would maybe be even liable to uh, a very, very severe punishment, maybe excommunication, uh, uh, shunning away from the community, and so on. If the communal authorities did that, that's a whole different ballgame, right? Um, I'll, I'll give you an example. In the book, there's this, a story actually from, from, from northern Spain, from um, a small town of, called Baroca, not too far from Saragossa. And there, there's a break into the local synagogue. And at a certain point, uh, the community realizes that the culprits, uh, although they were in some sort of communal uh, arrest, managed to break free and, 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 and disappear. 
And they realize that unless they make a real stand and say that these people are no longer part of the community um, and they are free game for anyone, uh, uh, we are not extending our protection over them any longer, right? Um, and what is interesting is that people within the community, especially family members of these renegade uh, uh, criminals, approach the community and say, um, you guys have pushed this too far because one of these people is about to convert to Christianity and you, by shunning them away, have created or, or rolled the ball, so to speak, uh, and created the situation where this person would eventually not be a Jew any longer, right? And this would be on your conscience. And the community is deliberating. And it reaches out to a, a, a legal adjudicator and to a rabbi, and it asks him whether or not they should re revert from their initial decision, reincorporate the person into the community, what kind of penance they should you know, deliver. Um, so these issues of external, internal, who's within, who's without, to what extent do we push this and, and where are the lines drawn are all questions that are very, very pertinent to what the book is trying to talk about. So, uh, one last question because we're uh, run, running out of time before we have to close, but uh, one is about whether you came across in your work in a different attitude uh, towards uh, frauding fellow Jews versus Gentile neighbors or uh, business partners. So yes, um, it, it's very clear. Um, frauding a fellow Jew is considered to be a worse felony uh, when one does it to a non-Jew, it's a different story. Nevertheless, there are regulations saying you should steer clear from that, right? Because this is again where that chip on the shoulder of every Jewish adjudicator kind of pops up and says, um, we are being looked upon. We are being, uh, uh, we, we are, we are mo our, our actions are being monitored. This is stuff that you do not want to leak out from the community, but definitely within, I think the mindset of Jews, um, fraudulent behavior towards fellow Jews is considered something that is worse. Fraudulent behavior towards people who are outside the community as in, I think every closed society um, uh, is, is, is not as bad. Does it change over time as, as you know, the situation of Jews changes in Europe from the pre-Crusade era with perhaps arguably a little bit more security to the post-Crusade era that it, where the Jewish community is a little bit more vulnerable? What I tried to suggest in the book is that after the Crusade, the first Crusade, um, Jews, especially in Germany, uh, receive a, a, a very serious blow and, and they, some of them at least, at least some of them, the more, I think, morally inclined people within the community. And I'm, I'm pointing specifically at a person called uh, Shmuel Hasid, Yudah Hasid's father, Yudah the Pious's father, Jews of the Pious's father. And it seems from his writing that he looks at what happened during the Crusades and he's thinking that some of how, some of the ways Jews were treated during the Crusade may have had their roots in the way Jews were treating both their closer circles and their external circles, and that people should do uh, should 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 look look into these matters and and treat uh, uh, these issues differently. Uh, so I think there is change over time, and definitely from these uh, sections of society that are more morally inclined, like Shmuel Hasid. So um, do you, um, Nick, want to add anything? Effie, do you I have to... so many more questions to ask that it's a little crazy. <laughs> so okay, one more question and then we'll let Effie okay. bring those up. Um, I had a question. Uh, uh, one thing that really struck me, uh, Effie, in, 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 in these and the accounts of the specific cases was um, mobility. Uh, you, 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 met, you bring up earlier on in the book this uh, the the somewhat older older notion that uh, that uh, Jewish communities enjoyed these very very long range trade contacts from an early time and how you know more recently scholarship has pushed back on that as, as a bit of an exaggeration. Nonetheless, in the stories that you tell, the case that you tell, it does seem to be the case so often that whether it is with property that's stolen in Cologne and shows up in Mainz 
or uh, a murderer who uh, you know is in Limoges and recruits the henchmen from Blois. That the that the, you get you do get that sense of the range of the Jewish communities, their connections across space to, to across towns, and in that second case, also across lordships, so across principalities, which seem to me to be something that um, both both for the for the jurist it, it creates more complexity and the communities creates more complexity but i wondered whether there was something about that that you you could relate to the specific sort of nature of the the kind of crimes in which jewish communities are being caught up with is mobility part of this larger situation um mobility is intertwined with with commerce and and a lot of these people are engaged in commerce and and i think they they think beyond the local in many respects Mm -hmm. um, they think beyond the locality. They think of networks. They think of islands of Jewish existence in the larger framework. Um, I'm, I'm thinking one of the things that struck me, and this is a conversation we had uh, with Magda and with Nina Rowe about um, about the uh, uh, the um, movements within Europe that are considered uh, more not orthodox, non orthodox. They also think in networks, right? Uh, the, uh, the Valdensians have their chapters in various towns and they move around within these networks. So when they, th they don't think like local lords who think about their territory, they think about a larger network of connections that, that kind of is existent in their minds. They travel from one island to the other. They are island hopping between um, Jewish communities slash uh, Valdensian houses, right? Or, or Valdensian communities. So, so this is something that is typical, I think, of minority societies that are scattered over a large territory. And to some extent, this um, both enables something that, that also uh, um, registers on, the, on, on, on penance, right? Uh, one of the things that we discussed before is the question of whether one can be exiled or not, right? Mm -hmm. So exiling someone from a, you know, a, 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 a agrarian community sometimes would spell death, right? Um, exiling someone from a mercantile community, um, he may, you know, just move somewhere else and return after three or five years, right? Um, we have such cases of people who are um, uh, shown the, do the door, so to speak, and asked to come back in five years. And they do, they, they, they come back because they can move around in these networks. Now, of course, sometimes these networks are informed that someone is being expelled, being ostracized, someone is being pushed away. Sometimes they're not. And the existence within the network enables this. And the, red, the, the level to which this um, is important to what is going on within the criminal uh, mindset is also important. Mm. I wondered about that, the criminal mindset, and just, you know, if you had stolen property and you were in a town and you wanted to get rid of the stolen property and you knew that you had a community of people you could sell it to who would quickly move it on somewhere else where, you know, it would, it might, that, that you know, it, it, it sort of, it suggests uh, mm -hmm. scenarios, the kinds of scenarios that you describe in the book, yeah. Mm -hmm. Indeed, indeed. All right, Effie, final words? <laughs> um, I, I, I just want to thank you. This has been swell. Um, just going back to this material again and, and delving into it is, is, is fascinating. Um, there's still a lot to be done there, I think. Um, and, and I just touched on the tip of the iceberg. I think there, there, there's way more to be done on this subject. Uh, and I'm looking forward to people picking this up, uh, tearing this to bits or producing something interesting, innovative from this. So, um, yeah. I thank you for the opportunity, both for, for stirring up my, my thoughts and, and reflecting on my, my work. Thank you. I appreciate it. And we look forward to having you next year. And I, I encourage to everybody coming. to read the book, whether you're in, interested in Jewish history or in medieval history, because Jews were part of medieval history. 